chief merchant from Saks Fifth Office will be coming in that day. So with that, I'd love to welcome you guys. Welcome Nicole Fischlisch. Um, she's a native Parisian, ranked among the top 50 most powerful and influential figures in fashion, and has brought a global perspective to America's department stores. Renowned for her appreciation of integrity, design, um, industry experts say Nicole has a laser-focused eye for scouting talent and champion designers such as Chloe, Christian, Christian Lacroix, Terry Mugler, Jean-Charles de Kasselbach, uh, Alexander McQueen, and Jeremy Scott, just to name a few. Former creative director, global forecaster, and visual storyteller for Saks Fifth Avenue, Ferragamo, and Macy's, Nicole continues to consult worldwide and also sits on FGI's board of directors. Please join me in welcoming Nicole to the stage. Hello. <laughs> Bonjour. <laughs> Welcome. Um, can you please kick off by just giving us a little more color around your background and your, your career path up until now? So, oh, you want me to start with Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. okay, so um, I'm very happy to be here. This, uh, this uh, place is really very iconic to me because I've been attending many, many, uh, on many occasions, some incredible people coming and talk here. So I'm very honored to be here today. Um, I started my career in Paris at a very young age. I was kind of a free spirit, a little bit of a rebel, not so much, but um, I was a good student, but I didn't really want to continue my studying. And I was very lucky because my parents supported me and let me kind of, you know, do what I wanted to do. So I started in, a, I was introduced into a, a buying office at the time in Paris called Gimbal Sachs. It was owned by the Gimbal store and the Sachs Fifth Avenue. And the office was also representing a lot of stores in America, in Canada, like Niman Marcus, Old Trenfu, etc. So when I started there, I was, uh, you know, at the lower level, an assistant, buying coffee, newspaper, and cigarette to two of my boss who were real bitches. <laughs> and when they hired me, I, you know, I spoke English still with the same uh, French accent, but the boss said, what am I going to do with this kid? Well, this kid was passionate about fashion, looking at all the trade fair, going in the most unexpected places, and discovered a lot of designers that were um, recognized in the 80s and then in the 90s. You know, I remember going to Kenzo um, in his little atelier when he just moved to Paris, and I still have in my mind the, fir the first dress he designed. And you know what, today it could still be on a runway in a collection. It's incredible how real, original talent with identity and integrity, whatever they have done, whatever year they have done it, is still relevant today in most cases. You know, last season I was looking at uh, some of the runway in New York and um, I was in Paris two months ago, I saw the retrospective, that's another example, of Thierry Mugler. Thierry Mugler I discovered in France also in the uh, late 80s. The rep called me at my office and said, I want to show you something. I said, sure, come. At the time, they would come with a suitcase to the uh, buying office, open the suitcase on my desk, and I saw this incredible jacket that she pulled out of the suitcase with the shoulder and the seaming and the, and, the t and the peplum. I had never seen anything like that. I went crazy, and a few weeks later, the Sachs team was in Paris to buy, you know, during the, the Ready to Wear collection, and we bought the collection exclusively 
for a few years, we launched the Angel Par Perfume at Saks. At the time, I was working in New York. But, you know, what I'm saying is, you know, he was, uh, if, if you've seen his work, and I hope you have, um, I was looking at some collection uh, in Harlem last season. There was a big show, Harlem Designer, and I saw some clothes that were literally very much like what he used to do, all the cutout and body conscious, which is still a very big trend today. So, you know, it's interesting not to see what's happening, you know, on the street or on the runway. You have to merge two today because more and more it's what's happening, you know. Yeah, that's great. So what else? <laughs> I mean, you know. So anyway, I worked in Paris, uh, for several years, and I learned the business of making clothes. What the clothes look inside is just as important as what they look outside. And the, the buyer at the time were themselves, you know, very so, kind of social lady. The store were owned by families. They were not owned by very big groups. So the buyer would come to Paris, stay at the Ritz. <laughs> And, and uh, you know, I would take them around, show what I had found, what I liked, and, you know, working with them, I learned a lot about the, the art, I call it the art of craft, fashion, couture, etc. And I did that for many years, several years, and I was involved with all product for Saks. Then I took over the Saks buying office in Europe. And then one day out of the blue, the chairman of Saks, it was 1991, was on his way back to New York and said to me, there's a fashion director, vice president position in New York. If you want it, it's yours. And I looked at him, I said, he was in his car going back to the airport. I said, why not? And I came here a couple of months later and uh, I used to come regularly when I was based in Europe because um, Saks did incredible trunk shows for Chloe when Karl Lagerfeld was designing Chloe. So um, the business was so strong that one day the, the president of Saks said, you know, we would like to do trunk shows. We would take the collection to more stores and the owner said, we don't know, we don't know what trunk show is. We, we, we don't want to do trunk show, we want, but if you want to do it, the only person who will allow to take the collection with her is Nicole Fischlis. So that's how I started to come to America twice a year, going in five different key cities, seeing who the customer was from, from Chicago to Miami to Los Angeles, etc. the key city and Palm Beach, the, the different profile of a customer. And, uh, and Carl would come over when there was a special uh, fragrance launch or something. You know, there were like three weeks trip. I would do four or five cities, meeting with a customer. So wow. really, that's my background. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and then I discovered that's my passion. Uh, a lot of designers in America as well. And, uh, and you know, I, I went to, uh, I was going to, for Saks, I was going, I reopened a, a fashion office. They basically didn't have any fashion office. So what did I do? I did um, trend presentation of, of recap of the runway, New York, Paris, London, uh, Milano, telling them, you know, key, key item, must have, color direction, fabric direction, print direction. I was involved with um, the, the visual people. I brought in a lot of artists to do a visual presentation in the, in the window. It was quite amazing. And I was uh, working with uh, marketing, choosing all the catalog and the newspaper and working on the seam of each of the catalogs. So it was a very, really, it was fashion director, but it's really a, a job that I built myself um, working for the image of the company. Like I would have regular meeting with the visual and decide what we would do from <coughs> one month to another in the window. What were the story, how, and, um, there's a lot of, 
anecdote. We don't really have the time, but I can tell you one of the designers <coughs> that you probably all know about is uh, Alexander McQueen. So I was in London. I love London. At the time, uh, there was very few journalists going to London. Uh, you know, they thought it was too individualistic, and it was. And I started to tell everybody, you cannot go to Milano and Paris without going to London. That's where there is true, young, unexpected creativity. So they started to come and to go. And one year, I, I met um, Susie Menkes, a very iconic journalist, still active today. And she said to me, I was at the first show of uh, Jeremy Scott, she came to me, she said, Nicole, you're the only one I always see in the most unexpected places. Are you going to London? I said, yes, I am. So she said, well, I want to introduce you to someone. I said, fine, let's do it. So after a show, she takes me in her car. We go on the outskirts of London in some big old building with a glass roof, and we walk into this atelier and there's this guy sitting on a bench, shy, young, Alexander McQueen. Wow. So I saw his first collection in London, which was so amazing. And Sachs bought it exclusively before any other store. And he was amazing. I mean, the show of, of, uh, of McQueen and the show of Mugler were like, you know, Valerie Steele is giving us the honor to be with us today. She can tell you because very <laughs> many times we sat together at those shows and it was like sometimes bringing tears to our eyes because it was so, so powerful. I remember every one of them. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> so what else do you want me to tell them? So you found your way to Farragamo? at one point? Yeah, so after 10 years in New York, completely out of the blue, I was very lucky because things came to me. I was not really, and I think that's the way you have to be, you know, you don't. Um, I got a phone call. Ferragamo was looking for a, for, a, for a fashion director. You know, they, they had not been showing anything on the runway, so they had met me because they were a huge, huge business with, with socks, not in shoes mostly, men and women. So I started to speak to them it too, because I was not really looking to take an hour to leave. Uh, but at the end, I got seduced by the history of the company, and I left after 10 years. And the reason I was leaving is also because Rosemary Bravo, the president, had left to go to, fair, to um, Burberry, oh. which she, re she relaunched. And I knew that Philip Miller, the chairman, was going to, to retire after two years. So when I went to tell him I was leaving, he was furious. He said, you how can you do that, leaving a family? I said, look, I'm not betraying you. I'm not going to Neiman. I'm not going <laughs> to any other store. It's another path in my life. And uh, I want, to, you know, I love Italy. I had always gone to Italy all my youth on vacation. My parents were in love with Italy. So I took the job. And it was fascinating because I, um, you know, they, they, they had no coordination. Shoes were working on one side, handbag were on the other side. Gosh. Ready to wear, they didn't have much left. So I met them, you know, communicate, work together, do trend, etc. And I brought in um, a designer called Marc Odibé that Valérie knows to do the fashion. Marc Odibé is uh, somebody that you probably have not heard of, but you should have, because he's the one who invented stretch with Dupont, Lycra, stretch material. So, um, and he, he still works, but he's the one who started really the fashion business at Prada. He was not, it was not known, you never, <coughs> he, he, they didn't give your name at the time. He was in the back, but he, uh, he was an incredible talent and, um, yeah, I studied Firenze about five years. 
learning about, you know, many other things. I didn't know how to make a shoes, uh, the heritage of the company and oh. things like that. And, um, and then after five years, I got a call from uh, a friend who used to be a GMM at Saks. And um, she told me, uh, <laughs> are, you are you interested to, uh, to talk to Macy? So I laughed. I said, in 10 years in New York, and more before on trip, I've never been to Macy's. <laughs> she said, they want to talk to you. So I said, OK, let me talk to them. I kind of uh, was tired of uh, being in Firenze. It's kind of provincial, even though, you know, I, I love a lot of seeing about Italy, of course. But I miss New York in a way. And uh, I spoke with a team at, at Macy's, and I really fell in love with the history of the company, what, what Macy's represented at, at the, and still does as part of the history of New York. Yeah. And I came, and um, I stayed with them about 10 years, and we did some incredible collaboration with uh, European designer and um, art windows and a lot of things like that. Elevated. And I, I was involved with some of their private brands, so that's it. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. So um, now I'm independent. I opened my own com consultant company and uh, I do some uh, consulting when I like the people and when they want me. That's, the right bet. That's perfect. So um, obviously you touched on working in Paris and you talked a little bit about what it was like, but I, have, I, I typically have a lot of students who are interested in going to different cities and want to hear a little bit about the different attitudes in Paris versus New York or the different work-life balance um, between the two. I wonder if you could touch on that in your experience. You know, I think that what's interesting about the Paris scene, although New York has changed a lot too, is that, you know, Fashion Week, for instance, is much more international than New York is, although New York has become much more international than it was. But when you think of Paris in the, in the 80s, and in, they are the, first, the, the one that recognize all the very famous Asian designer, you know, like Yoji Yamamoto, Issey Miyake, and today you have huge talent like Sakai showing there also. And, and so it's a, it's a more international scene, and it's a city that really attracts a huge amount of international uh, journalists and press, much more than here, much more than London. You know, there is a history about the Paris couture and ready to wear. You should all read the book of uh, Valerie Steele about it, and uh, you will know all the What's true the title? history. Hmm? What's the title? Paris fashion, cool. <laughs> Check it out. But I think in general, uh, Paris is very open to, to foreign talent. Yeah. What it, was the office like? I mean, did you feel like the hours are similar to New York hours, or people there work more or less similar? I mean, I dep it depends which brand you want. You know, everybody has had a kind of reinvention these days. Yeah. And, and you have big groups that are taking over all the brand, and then you see brands that used to be uh, trendy in the 60s and 70s that are re reinvented. And you, when you, you look at it, you wonder where they're going, because it has no DNA into it, yeah. which is kind of sad, Yeah, you know? And I won't give any name. <laughs> <laughs> but. Yeah. Have you ever found it difficult working in New York as a French native? As a French person? Yeah. I, I was always very welcome. Yeah. I never had any issue, in, in, ever. That's great. And also, I was raised with, with um, by parents who um, adored America. 
My mother always said our daughter lives in America. It's normal oh. because Americans saved us. <laughs> That's how they felt. Yeah. So from being a child and they had some American friend, I was used to uh, coming here anyway from my use in the business, coming here a lot. And it's, you know, and when people tell me, well, which city do you like best, New York or Paris? I love both. It's two different worlds. Yeah. There's room in your heart we, I always use a, a French song. Entre les deux, mon cœur balance. Between, it, a, it's a child song. Between the two, my heart swings. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. Um, so I wonder if you could talk us through, I know in fashion, there is no such thing as a typical week or even day. I feel like there's always... It's always changing every day, which is what makes it so fun. But I wonder if you could talk us through a little bit about kind of a typical week for you in, as a fashion director. When I was a fashion director. Yes, yeah. The number one thing was to be curious. Not to miss anything. To visit every possible place I could go to. I was into art show contemporary, classic, any art show I could go to, I would go and absorb. I would go to any tr uh, flea market. I was obsessed with flea market from any country I went to. Whether I was in London, in Italy, in Paris, I was at the flea market every weekend, and I'm still at the flea market here every weekend, almost. Yeah, that's cool. I think it's very important. I was into all the trendy boutique and the concept store and department store and, and you know, just looking, being curious, not um, necessarily judging, but absorbing. Yeah. And looking at runway constantly, looking at shoes, looking at bags, looking at makeup, looking at everything on the runway or off the runway, seated on a terrace and watching people go by. I mean, last week I went to, uh, to the uh, art fair, outside art fair. Do you know that art fair? It's every year on uh, 18th Street. It's a um, self-taught artist and um, a lot of uh, art brut and a lot of naive art and it's extremely inspiring. I mean, you look at a, at a painting and you can, de you can create your own color palette. Wow. That's, that's how I used to do. I used to fall in love with a painting, whether it's a Picasso or anybody not known, and I would see the balance of the right color palette. I used to tell my assistant when they worked on color uh, thing, this doesn't rhyme. You have to make this color palette, this color story needs to rhyme. There it needs to be an energy into it. To me, it was the easiest thing to do. When I was done with my storytelling or forecasting, I would pull out all my pantone book and boom, 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 the palette was done. Yeah. So I, I think, you know, flea market, art shows, runway, to study and, and look at people on the street. On, on, on Saturday after this uh, visit of the Outsider Art Fair, I sat at uh, a cafe around there and I was like, I just saw it on the runway. Yeah. It was like incredible, the crop top, the oversight puffer jacket, the mixture of white or with black or pastel combination and hand painted t-shirt and uh, men's coat. Yeah. So you go out, you're inspired by these different places. You what have do you, to do all that. What do you, yeah, what do you do with the information? Mm -hmm. What do you do with the information from there for, for Saks or for Macy's? It stays here and here. I, make, I don't even make note, you know, I know that there is something to say about this theme or that theme or that stories or, you know, sometimes it can be a movie, sometimes it's a combination of things. Um, but what I find very interesting today is um, 
the, the combination of uh, lifestyle, the combination of tailoring with feminine, the combination of uh, gender blending, I like that a lot. I saw a lot of shows of new rising designer. The first day of the New York Fashion Week was uh, called, um, it was at the Canoe Studio, it was called um, New York Men's Day. And I was very impressed with what I saw there. And there were men's, men's clothes, but the, it doesn't matter. There could be women clothes as well. Yeah. And uh, it, I thought it was very inspiring. And there was one des young, de fairly young designer based in, uh, in California. His name is Stan. And Tristan, Tristan Deadweiler, did, did, did and he um, works with recycled uh, quilt and fabric, foreign fabric and American quilt, and he deconstructs them and reconstructs them. It is absolutely incredible, wow. the work he does. Yeah. You know, he re giving work to to some you know Reuse. women yeah. that there that used to do those uh, I find that very uh, interesting yeah definitely but there is a big movement of that too absolutely um, early America you know but I guess what I'm wondering also is just what offices that you would interact with as a fashion office. At the least, sex. to me, the, the I'm, you know, I'm a very individualistic person. Uh -huh. my, I would do my own thing. I would just subscribe to the minimum trend service. The one I really think is exceptional is, um, I, I would not go, you know, I would like to see what they think when I'm done. Yeah. But I would never re re reinvent my own story. And the, the one that I think is really uh, very prophetic is uh, Lee Edelcourt, Trend Union. She always shows, she used to show here. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's a very interesting trend service. Yeah. And uh, I also like Mint Moda. Mm. Uh, who is a friend of mine too, and yeah. she's very uh, individualistic as well. I'm just going to flash the um, check-in again for students because I realized I hadn't. Give me one second. Do you have questions? Nope. <laughs> I can't hear a thing. Um, she's wondering if you can repeat the It's trend. too early. Yeah. It's not the question moment. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. No, it's fine. I to hear it. <laughs> the, um, the, trend, the trend site that you just mentioned, um, Modal. Mint, right? Mint Modal. Yeah, thank you. Mint Modal. I'll give you a list of them. I think she's been oh, coming here not. in the past to make some speech. Sorry, you guys, I froze my computer here. What happened? Okay. There we go. But Leah Delcourt for go. Uh, Trend Union is amazing. <sighs> it, you know, it's very kind of intellectual, but, and she does, uh, she does presentation that she goes to, like she went to Brazil last year, and she, Brazil, and she, interviewed a lot of, uh, of people based there to talk not just about fashion, but the craft, you know. Um, so, but the fashion office's responsibility to the company is to... Yeah, I created the fashion office when I was at, at Saks. I hired a team, you know, and, uh, and we, we all worked together. One, one person was in charge of... Uh, Sportswear, another one was in charge of coats and dresses, uh, ready to wear, whatever, you know, children, yeah. menswear. So I had about uh, 12 people. Oh, that's great. Each of them I had a couple of assistants, depending. And the same thing happened when I went to uh, Macy's. Oh, that's great. Um, and we did, uh, we did two major presentations a year with a whole book. 
to give to the buyer uh, with the color palette and the fabric inspiration and Perfect. the must have all of that. Yeah. And so then the buyers took, yeah. took your expertise that and you had used yeah. from hunting the market to be more informed. Yeah, but you know, when I was at Saks, I would do the buy with the buyer to make sure that, uh, you know, they were focusing on the, uh, on the, most of the time they knew what they were doing, but it was a very interesting interaction because we pulled uh, images for windows and for advertising and catalog and all of that. And your office would also interact with marketing to help All steer the them. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, when I came out of a, of a, of a show, <laughs> I loved it. I had my lease. I gave it to the head of a, of a, of sales or whatever, and it always had Windows, Vogue. L, Harper's Bazaar, New York Times. I gave all my lists right there. So I knew I, I wanted to make sure we were the first and I would have the exclusivity on the, on the selection because every other store were do, was doing it much later. <laughs> and um, I remember sometimes a, a designer would call and say, Nicole, would you mind very much changing your ad? Monsieur Armani would like to use that for their own advertising. <laughs> Highest compliment. That's funny. <laughs> That's funny. Um, and how does the role kind of cycle through each year? Would you, you, would do, you said you did two main books that you published a year. No, there was many books in between. And at the time you had, you, and still do, you had the, in the pre-collection, mm -hmm. pre-spring, pre-fall. What's interesting today is that there is no season anymore. Yeah. You know, you look at a collection, it's, it's winter, and you think it's summer. That's true. But they've blurred, the lines have blurred quite a bit. The weather has blurred quite a bit. It, it's not <laughs> anymore about uh, the seasonality has a very different connotation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what does an entry level job look like for someone in a fashion office? <coughs> you know, it can be, it can be uh, someone coming out of a, of a fashion school. Or it can be an assistant of a buyer within the store or, with a, or from another store, an assistant buyer, because it's always good to have a sense of business as well. Yeah. <clears throat> so for someone out there that may be interested in, <clears throat> sorry, terrible allergies this week, that may be interested in working in a fashion office, what would you recommend as good qualities to highlight? Um, good quality. To be hired. Good qualities, good skills. <clears throat> you, you, you need to have a, a strong point of view, a sense of style, a sense of curiosity, somewhat of, a, of a humility. Nobody wrote the book. You can always learn something. You have to be, you know, sure of yourself, but, but open to listen and to have a dialogue. And if, some, if somebody is, is rude to you, be extra nice. It's uh -huh. the, best way, the best way to respond. Fly over the cuckoo nest, I always say that. Just be yourself, but be, be nice. Don't be pretentious. We learn all our life. But be curious. And, and the, the one essential thing is to listen to your instinct. Listen to this little voice inside you, because we live in a, in a society today where we forget that, or we are kind of um, how put pressure on, you know? Just be convinced of what you, you want to do and what you, you think you are, but be open at the same time. So you, Does it make sense? Yeah, no, I think that's great advice. Um, what what type of work would a, someone if, at the first level in a fashion office be doing on your team when you, you know when you have a team of twelve? I mean, you know, <clears throat> I had f f f f most of the of the fashion di director that worked with me. 
you know, st stayed or moved on into the market or did, did other things eventually. But, and some went into the buying team. Oh, yeah, later on. Because you know, if you if you really want to be to, uh, to become a designer, yes, it's good to do uh, to make a stop in a, in a fashion office if there are any. I mean, how many stores have real fashion office today? I don't know. Yeah. And there isn't that many uh, many position there. Uh huh. But I think it's a good step to have an overview of what the business is like and what creativity is in the country or in general. It's, it's a learning step. Yeah. I wonder if you feel comfortable sharing with us where your favorite place to work over the years has been and why that was. Yeah. Your favorite? My favorite designer? The favorite, the, your favorite place, your favorite experience in, in work. Um. <clears throat> Paris, my, my beginning, Your my beginning. first, my beginning, yes. Because I, I met and discovered uh, incredible talent. And then Saks, because then I also uh, promoted and discovered many talent from other places in Europe. And here too. Yeah, that's great. The whole generation, you know, of uh, Asian designer that live here and that have made a pass and uh... great <laughs> um, what are you most proud of hmm? from your career what what do you have the most pride in from your career path my pride I don't have pride <laughs> <laughs> I'm just I have, you know, happiness and joy from the people, from the talent I have met and the talent I have promoted and supported on both sides of the ocean. And I was very, uh, always stepped back and it was never about me, it was always about him or her. Yeah. Today things have changed a lot, but... Uh, <laughs> You know, the best example is the mood at a fashion show runway. You know, you would be feeling like honored to sit and attend a presentation. Today, when you sit, you have to ask the person next to you, excuse me, I can't see. <laughs> yeah. There was no iPhone. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you sat and looked and absorb everything attention. visually. And so, it went straight to your soul sometime. Yeah. That's good. Over the years, you have certainly met some really, really interesting people. I wonder if you yeah, have any yeah. stories of, of... Do you want to hear stories? Of interest, of the most interesting person you've met or the, most, the couple most interesting people you've it's, met in your career? Karl Lagerfeld was an example. Karl Lagerfeld, did you say? Yeah. When we did the, I called, I called him, I called his, to do a, um, a collaboration with Macy's, and there was talk, you know, among the lawyer, etc. And the night, and one night at nine o'clock, the lawyer called PM, called me at home and said, Mr. Lagerfeld wants you to know first that he's going to say yes. Yeah. to the contract. Oh, great. And I, I had goosebumps. I was so excited. That's amazing. But, you know, I have many stories. Um. Yeah. <laughs> um, do you ever feel like you had to lean on your network of people to move your career forward? No. You kept, I mean, you, you mentioned a couple times. <laughs> <laughs> I told you I'm a kind of an individualistic person. I, I, was, I was really very lucky. Yeah. I, I love what I did. I didn't want to study, but I learned a lot. My parents were very, my father and my mother would take me to museum every weekend in Paris. We would look at everything, museum, street, architecture. My father was fascinated by... Uh, by history and architecture. My mother was a total 
free spirit, but also she loves beauty, she read a lot. So I think I was, uh, you know, totally um, inspired by, by this and the way that they supported me and uh, let, me, let me go my own way. But I was lucky to be introduced to this you know, before going to this fashion office, I worked for three months in a haute couture company called, which doesn't exist anymore, called Jacques Heim. Jacques Heim. And I was passing the needle, you know, I would stand wow. in the little room where the, the, they fitted the room, the customer, and I was standing there passing the pin and looking the guy doing the canvas uh -huh. on the customer. You learn. From A to Z. Yeah. Going to a big trade fair of fabric is very important too. I mean, I hope you all go when there is a trade fair like Première Vision or any of those fabric trade fair go happening in New York. It's very important to go there and to see what they are showing. What they, there is always a big trend place to visit. Yeah. So you have an idea about color direction, about print direction, about, you know, what are the new fabric, what, you know, is it about plaid, is it about animal print, which is really what's happening now, by the way. You yeah, get that, actually, runway. that's one of my next questions. Like what do you crazy. feel like is... The your plaid. Your favorite. It's in, yeah. it's, I, I'm having fun watching all the traditional material being reinvented, like yeah. plaid, but not boring flat plaid. Plaid combined among, among themselves, different plaid mixed together, or plaid with denim, or plaid with, with faux fur, anything. And then all the idea of shine, silver, essentially lots and lots of silver. silver. And fabric treatment like patent and shine, a ton, a ton of black patent or many runway, but also color patent, dark green, bright blue, you know. Yeah. Animal print is still a big thing also. Floral, garden floral. I, I don't see as much uh, influence of art print as I saw in the past season, but um, I see a lot of artwork like remolding and new, new shape and new draping and uh, vol volume, lots of volume, lots of still sleeve interest. Right. <laughs> Say something. <laughs> um, do you have a favorite piece of clothing you bought for yourself that st has stayed with you through the years? No, I sold everything. <laughs> <laughs> no, a few years ago, I, I had to get space. And uh, I started to put together on racks my Chloe, my Saint Laurent, my Ungaro, <laughs> my uh, whatever, Calvin, um, Thierry Mugler, and uh, people came to see it, and one person said to me, you know, this is really a collection, don't sell it to, uh, don't put it in a vintage place, You'll, they'll come every, you, you have to find somebody to buy the whole thing, and I was, I did a guy who was based in Philadelphia and was only selling to a museum and a high-end vintage shop. He came, wow. he took everything wow. in one shot. I was so happy. Yeah. I had no nostalgia because it was handled very well. The clothes were photographed in a catalog and I, I was just happy that it was handled well. And then I gave a lot to some young girl I know uh -huh. that I like, and they wear it like incredible. So. <laughs> but personally, I like, um, as a designer, for things I may buy, I like uh, Dries van Noten. Mm. He's a Belgian designer, he shows in Paris. And what I like about his clothes is, is that they, they have no, no timing. It's very individualistic. Okay. Yeah. And there are clothes that you can collect and... 
That's People great. here say to you, sometimes say to you, uh, is that new? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. You know the question, is that new? Yeah. <laughs> no, it's not, but I don't <laughs> tell them. <Re> <laughs> Um, what piece of advice would you give to students who are just entering the industry these days? What piece of advice would you offer to students who are just about to enter the industry for the first time? I told them, I, I think I said, I said, you know, you, you need to have a point of view and you need to listen to your little uh, instinct. There's a number of students in the room, I think probably, probably close to half, who are interested in launching their own brand. Fabulous. Yeah. Do it. <laughs> if you can, you know, be supported financially to do it. But I'm, I'm seeing some uh, recognized designer now. They started like you, do, you want to do it. They did it themselves. They, they did the clothes themselves and they show the clothes and eventually it will lead them somewhere. Great. Um, why don't I turn it over to you guys? Because I'm sure that there are a lot of questions out there. What kind of characteristics have you looked for when you're scouting new designers that have made them successful? What kind of character? Yeah, in their, in their quality of product. You know, what do you look for in a new designer that you're gonna tell, tell your company about? I look for true inspiration. I look for clothes that, that are individualistic, which I, by that I don't mean, you know, necessarily extreme. I mean clothes that have their own inspiration. Clothes that, of course, you, you get inspiration by this one or that one, but clothes that are really created with your own spirit. I think it's very important to have a very wide view of what's happening today, not just in America, but all over the world. Even looking at a designer from, from Japan and designer from Belgium, and, and you know, very often they show in Paris anyway. So, um, and then you, you let it sit, and then you think about, you know, it's your own spirit. It's like a writer, it's like, you know, any kind of creativity, if you are in front of a, a, of a painting and you want to paint, you're not going to necessarily go and copy a Van Gogh or a Picasso. Yeah. But you can look at a color palette within that painting and do, and do something in your world. Does that answer your question? No, I mean, what other questions are out there? Yeah, back here. I can't hear us. Where did you do the most networking? Networking, meeting new people, and how did you maintain relationships? Every time you talked about, you know, someone gave you a call and said, you want to come over? You know, how did you build those relationships over the years? Even in America, here, the CFDA does things to promote uh, young, unknown, or rising designer. Yeah. So you, you have to keep your eyes open all the time. I'm back here.
I, I, <clears throat> she's wondering if you can talk about how um, general trends emerge. You know, when you talk about an entire runway season and all the trends that kind of rise to the top. How does that sort of happen? Okay. Okay, so you start by, this New York, right? So you, you look at um, a runway and suddenly you see one color or one fabric, you like it. You, you, you know, you take the image out and then you see London, then you see Milan, and you may see the scene emerging and become more and more important. And when you're done with Paris, you do a final analysis, and then you know that, yes, tailoring is back. Yes, romantic is very still valid, but what's interesting is that suddenly, around, I'm just giving an example, okay? So, a ruffle dress under a quilted buffer, oversized, who would have thought of it? A trench coat done in, in pattern color, right over an evening dress, or a, an evening skirt with a sweater, it's, it's become to be a, a must-have look, the skirt and the sweater. But what kind of skirt? It's an asymmetric skirt. It's a sheer skirt. It's a ruffled skirt. It's a long skirt. It's a mini skirt. But it's always with a sweater. Sometimes it's striped. Sometimes it's oversized. Sometimes it's crochet. Sometimes it's uh, cable stitching, you know, big. It's... it's that's what makes it very interesting when you start putting your idea together and you edit the ideas. Yeah. It's a lot of work. But it, uh, it's, cu it's about curiosity. You go, initially, you go with what appealed to you, and then you start making your story. Is, am I Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Does sure. It, she likes it. She, yes. She, <laughs> no, but you, you, you know, I don't mind a dialogue. If you disagree, raise your finger and say it. I can hear you. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's it's the mask. Yeah, yeah, the masks make it hard, but <laughs> it's okay. No, no, it's okay. So I, I guess a back a step. You observe what you see on the runways and you're able to then kind of, you know, gleam a high level um, summary of what you found to be the big ideas. But what I think what she's trying to understand is how do the designers seem to have similar themes in any given year? <laughs> There's so many different types of knitwear now. Yeah. Ribbed, cable stitch, patched, re-embroidery, and the skirt can go from mini to maxi, from, from slim and draped to ruffle and layered, and, and, and then they wear the skirt over the pants. Even guys do that. They wear skirts over pants. Yeah. And you know what? I like it. Yeah. <laughs> I like the look. It's, it's done in a very modern way. I saw, as I told you earlier, I saw a few um, men designers doing that uh, at the beginning of New York Fashion Week. One is called um, Terry Singh. He's from India, but he works here. And it's all about, you know, uh, 
boot or jacket kind in, in or regular tailor jacket and you know, fitted skirt or all kind of all that. It looks fabulous. Yeah. Beautifully made. Hopefully that helps a little. I mean, I think it's an evolution as well. I think you don't usually just see a trend kind of pop up out of nowhere. There's sort of some sort of rise to it that, that makes it so that you're seeing it everywhere. You know, as I said, yeah. what's really interesting today is, yes, the, the must have, but how each designer reinterprets lifestyle or how they combine the lifestyle how it's becoming very um, current to see dressy with sporty, yeah. tailored with soft, feminine, masculine, you know what I mean? Active and, and, and romantic. But look at you. Look, you know, I was waiting outside taking photographs uh, because I was a bit early. Some of you guys look like just out of the runway. <laughs> That's why I'm saying it's very important to see, to look. Yeah. Go to the park on Sunday and look at people passing by. I did that yesterday on the way back from the west side. I was like, sit on the terrace. And be inspired. And look. For sure. Your follow-up question? Yeah. What can a young designer do to get noticed by a fashion office? What kind of a designer? What can a designer, a young designer do to make sure they're noticed by a fashion office? You know, to get their collection seen. Oh. I think it's very good to, um, to get in a showroom that will do that for you. Uh, of course, the showroom will take a percentage on the sales, but it's very hard to be both um, a, a, a creative person and a, a business person. It's in, important to understand the business and to, to understand, that's why I said earlier, you need to see what's happening in the store, what you see on the floor, even there, though there is less and less store in New York, but it's important that you, you go and shop, you know, from high hand to mass market, and, and see what those stores do, and see what clients do. You know, it's not just about Zara or about, you know, but even if you go to a very high-end, sophisticated boutique like, um, what's the name of Comme des Garçons. It's so inspiring to see not just their visual, but what they have. And uh, so in terms of making the business with a store, if you have the collection, I, I think there is no other way than either being in a trade fair, but I don't know how trade fair are still existing today, that give, some, some of them give space for free or very little to, to some new designer, or they used to do it. Yeah. Or CFDA used to help designer do uh, showing. Uh, I, mean, I remember CFDA having a big showroom in Paris during Fashion Week saying uh, American in Paris, it was called. Wow. And there was about 10, 12 designers every season showing in there. Wow. That that shows. That's nice. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, right here. What? what can be said about fashion? I'm sorry, repeat it. <laughs> like customers' integrity across different markets. Um, like what's something that they all share from luxury to like spaces? What is something that all consumers have in common across different price points? You know, from a Macy's to a Saks, for example. They don't. <laughs> The, you, 
you know, 30, when I was there, 30% of the business uh, of Macy's in ready to wear was done with their own brand. Uh, and then their big, their big business is done with the licenses of the five key, you know, well, they consider key designer, T Tommy Hilfiger, Michael Kors, Ralph Lauren, um, Calvin Klein. Calvin Klein. Those are the big, big business. It's all licenses. For me, when I looked at it, is it really the spirit of the designer? <laughs> but that's called business. Yeah. Yeah. I'm be being very honest. That, that's great. Honesty is good in this room. <laughs> I remember one season speaking of that. The GMM, General Merchandise Manager of Macy's, came to me and says, Nicole, I want you to do a special presentation for Ralph Lauren. I looked at him for the team. I said, are you kidding me? I think, do you think they're going to come and listen to what I have to say? I said, let me think about it. Yeah. So I thought about it very quickly, and then I said, OK, I know what to do. I kept my own presentation exactly as it was, except that at the end of each of my trend story, I went in their archives through my, uh, you know, through, uh, you know, Vogue Runway or any of those things. I went five years back on their runway collection oh. and I would do a finale saying this is how Ralph would do. Yeah. Oh. It was easy. I yeah. didn't change my thinking process, but I was incorporating their essence and going back to their few years back eventually yeah. was a good point because it was showing respect to the brand. Yeah. So I did that. So they were impressed. Now, did, they, did it really influence <laughs> the them? <design>. The license. <laughs> it's hard to turn that ship. <laughs> But I did my job. Yeah. Right here. You wanted to say something, so. Um, can you speak a little bit more about the, the queen show and stuff? About what? The outside of the queen show. The first, the first Alexander McQueen show that you saw. It, it was in London. It was a small show. It was not the extravaganza that you, he would later on do in Paris. You know, the music was fabulous, and, the, and the, the clothes were already very, very, very strong. And then when he started to show in Paris, he went to the most unbelievable, unexpected places, just like Mugler would, would do, except that he had money from the fabric, from the fragrance behind him. So that allowed him to do some incredible, incredible production, like having key models, of course, at the time, you know, models were the big star. And, uh, and I, you know, going back to Burigler or even um, McQueen, I remember uh, the, press, the chairman of Saks saying to me after the show, what is this? What can we buy? And you know, you think we can buy? I said, yes, come to the showroom. Yeah. Because this is a show, and initially, shows were made for the press. Even, yes, the buyer, but it was for the press. So they were attracting the press to have, a, uh, you know, something so creative and inspiring that they would get a free editorial eventually. But, but, um, in the showroom, you see the, cl the close, you know, close to you, you see a jacket, how it's cut, how it's made. You don't necessarily need to buy it with the same skirt, or, you know, you can do, translate it, not change it, but you see the clothes without all the extravaganza that uh, comes on a runway. Yeah, right here. Would you be able to speak in the microphone? Maybe we'll hear you a little better. If you hear that? 
I'm sorry, can you repeat? <laughs> Can you talk in the microphone? <laughs> what has been the most, um, the best part about watching a brand launch? From most challenging, sorry, the most challenging about launching a brand. You mentioned launching a private label brand at Macy's. Yeah, and speaking with them. Uh, you, you need to, to have, you need to have price point that are relevant to the customer you want to reach in your mind, initially. And you, you have to have competitive prices. How do you position yourself? Are you contemporary? Are you designer? Are you, you know, wh what's the approach? Who is the store you want to reach? Who is the customer you want to reach? And are your prices, you know, what, where is your production going to be? What, what you know, it's, it's all of that. Yeah. N knowing who, knowing your, um target customer at the outset. And having people that, that are professional on the business side to, to support your idea. You know, there is some, some guy here in New York that do that. Yeah. That help you find that, your path. That do that with young talent that can advise them and consult that with them. And if they think they, they have the talent to, uh, to expand, then they will eventually yeah. Hopefully, does that answer your question? Uh, I mean, is that answering your question? Well, I just don't know. Maybe she's not able to answer that question as well as someone else because she's never really launched a brand herself from from a challenging standpoint to be able to say um, yeah so I don't know I think she's saying what, what she's seen out there in the industry and what was successful and what made them successful is knowing their own um, point of view so probably the most challenging is just knowing who you are at the outset so that you can represent uh, you know United Front <laughs> and who, who you're going to reach, who you want to reach. Who is your muse as a client? Who do you want to reach? Yeah. And you, you may want to reach, you may not have a specific profile in mind either. Because you know, don't forget the quote, it's not about age, it's about attitude. Yeah. And it's not, a, 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 and there is this whole gender blending as well today. I mean, 10 years ago, I went to the chairman of Macy's and I said, look at such and such brand in Paris. They do the boys and girls in the same shop. Why don't you open a department with basic, traditional, but modern clothes? The puffer, the denim, the oversized sweater, the cardinal sweater, the white shirt. Why don't you do a space to one of your buyer and do that for me and she. It, it, it was very avant-garde. Yeah. It, they didn't get it. No. But look what's happening today. Yeah. Uh, Tamara. Uh, <laughs> how do you sell your ideas to the company as a whole? Like your, you know. When I was at Sachs, it was incredible. Because the, the, the chairman of Sachs, he was 
chairman had hired me himself, and the president was Rosemary Bravo, and she was passionate about fashion like I was. And, she, they, and we were a team. We were a real team. We came in any showroom in Paris, Milan, New York, wherever, and we got whatever we wanted because there was a vibe and a respect for creativity and fashion. And when I wanted something, I give you an example. I was in Paris, and every, I would stay until the end because I would sometimes go with the buyer, next to the buyer and make sure we were doing the right, you know, not that I, we were a team. I didn't tell the buyer what to do, but I would, you know, consult a little bit and make sure we were doing this to cover the window or the ad, whatever. And one, a few times I would call her, she was back in New York, and I would say, was well, there is so and so, a new designer showing, da 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 da, it's fabulous, so everybody's gone, what do we do? Yeah, she said, Let, leave me alone, buy it. And I was not a buyer. <laughs> I think you win some, you lose some sometimes. Problem, uh, and I'm not, I don't want to speak negative, okay? Because you all starting and you need to, have, to follow your instinct and to go for what you believe in, and et cetera, et cetera. But lots of stuff today are thinking numbers before creativity. And, and you know, and numbers, sure are important, but there should be a, a, a percentage of the volume of the business that goes to help new talent. Yeah, yeah. In the back in the white shirt. I have a question about fashion industry, like when you head yeah, would you be able to come down to the microphone? I'm sorry, we're, we're having a hard time. <laughs> I just want to ask, like, when you have that to all for my when you have the all here and the and the general of the community has been able to find, and right now I'm going to ask you, So your, your comment is around the 1990s into the 2000s, there was so much new and inspiring things coming on the runway. And, yes. and now things feel a little yeah. flat. Yeah. The 90s were amazing. Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is your question, why do you think that is, that it's, it's yeah. dull right now? Yeah. <laughs> is fashion dead? Let's <laughs> <laughs> hope not, right? <laughs> But that will come back. 
To share. Yeah. <laughs> we can, I can share her contact. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. You, are you okay with me sharing your contact information with them, or, or, yeah. or how should they get in touch? Is that the best? Your email? Okay. You can see my Instagram. Yeah. Sometimes I don't always show my dog. You're dumb. <laughs> yes, in the back. As an, as an Indian designer, she's wondering, she's not seeing many in a Saks or a Macy's, and what could be recommended to you know, get it's seen? Funny because I saw two Indian designers in New York doing Fashion Week. One is called La Fouri. You, you know him? I was invited to his uh, opening party here in New York. I liked it very, very much. And the other one is this menswear designer called uh, Terry Singh, who showed the first day. I think, I think New York is opening more to, uh, to foreign designer than they, that's one of the things I told you at the beginning. Paris is Paris because So would it be, you think, that more Indian designers should feel encouraged to show in different cities, like New York yeah. and Paris? And, yeah. yeah. I, think, I think it's very important to try to take your work outside of your own bubble. Yeah. Like you, you want other clients. You, you, you want more clients than just selling in America. You, I mean, it's fine. You sell in California, in Florida, maybe. That's what sometimes it's good to, to try to invest in. 
a uh, who are the showroom that could help when you have the collection ready. Yeah. And so, okay, so you, you have to pay, uh, if you're lucky, you pay on the on a percentage on what they sell. And some showroom here show in, uh, in Europe as well. <coughs> Hopefully that's not a showroom. You didn't have any showroom people coming to speak to them? <coughs> um, we have people coming on a sales team later on in the semester. Maybe I can send you someone. Yeah, if you have some, if you have some ideas, that'd be helpful. Yeah. Not that you didn't pay for this sale event, but it's nice for them to know. Yeah. Right here. Great question. How is working in fashion today different from when you first started out? It shouldn't be different. <laughs> so you don't think it's different? You think it's the same? No. Yeah. I, I think. Uh, But what about um, how social media or, you know, just the I digital age has changed media. things? <laughs> yeah. I think it's, I don't know, uh, uh, to, I'm wondering if people are not getting tired of it right now. Maybe. Maybe, yeah. I think in general, trends move a lot faster through the public than they probably did, you know, in the early 90s, late 80s. Would well, you agree with that? <laughs> well, <I do>. <laughs> <laughs> Taking notes. <laughs> uh, Wilson. Do you have any favorite emerging brands right now? Earl. Earl? Yeah. Can you repeat the name? The, name? Uh, the, the one you're just speaking of. Bonnie Cashin.
He, he's interested in uh, brands that um, are are interested in kind of representing American culture, like folk art. American brands that represent American culture. What do you think? <laughs> yeah. Makes, I mean, I think I love, I love the fact that it's not just Levi's gym anymore. It's much more than that. Yeah. I think it was on the, on the runway of uh, one of the big high-end designers yesterday. It was an oversized trench coat. It was amazing. Yeah. Right, I'm um, here. When you want to buy us products, were you looking for specific pieces or like a specific customer in mind when you were going to these shows? Do I have a customer in mind when I was in sex? Mm. Yes. Yeah. When you would pick when we when you would uh you know pull together your fashion yeah. direction. <laughs> hasn't been a, hasn't made for a very fun fashion. <laughs> yeah, COVID zooming has not made for very fun fashion. That's very true. Uh, any more questions? Uh, in the way back in the in the purple. <laughs> How does the job differ when you're working for a brand like Ferragamo versus a department store versus like Zach's? It's, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's kind of another world. For instance, I'll give you one little story. When I started there and I saw the logo that Salvatore had created, the niche, the original logo. There, um, 
Yeah. This is just, they're just a little example. I said to them, go to the archives. Salvatore created so many shoes for, for all the stars in Hollywood. You know the history, right? The, the wedge and everything. I said, you know what we should do? It's not maybe not going to be volume, but you should take the key shoes, five pair, no more, and do limited edition, and you get all the prices. They want to do it. Uh. They do it after I was gone. <laughs> <laughs> but they did it eventually. Yeah. It, it's just a little example. I mean, I don't want to go on this. But yeah. Thank sometimes you. it works. Sometimes, you know, you need to come back and be passionate. And I think we have time for maybe one more. Yes, you know, it's like yeah. a, a, a stone. You, you tell them, I, so I, I was lucky to work with a team in the 90s that was totally wanting to change the image, etc. And uh, if, if they, they took a chance. I mean, it was not necessarily new designer. We did that all the time. It was not necessarily big volume, but it was helping the brand and being recognized by the press for being having avant-garde product, models. Yeah. Uh, I mean, one more question out there, unless we're done. Are you going to Right here. I thought I saw. Looking back at your career, is there anything you would have done differently? That's what? That you would have done differently? No. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> I love what I did. I was blessed to be able to work and meet such fantastic people and to be supported and to go with my conviction and my instinct. And I was very lucky. And I have no nostalgia. I, I, uh, I looked... Uh, there, there is a, a quote from the Sanskrit, which I found in a little friend at the flea market years back. I will send it to you. You can send it to them because it's really pretty. It says, look at today because tomorrow is over and looking at today will make a better future. I like that. 
Yeah, <laughs> that's a good one. And it's very true for fashion, I would say. Uh -huh. yeah, very true for fashion, yeah. You know, seeing that annoying me, there is many, there has been many, of course. Short memory. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Many people, good people, fly over. That's it. Don't keep it in you. Nicole, this was amazing. Thank you so much for coming. A lot of talent in this room. <laughs> so you guys, just a reminder, these are our guests next week. If you want to send anything in ahead of time, please do for, for your lecture prep questions. And I will send you our end of class survey. This is actually um, anonymous. It is a mid-semester check-in with you guys um, so that you can give some real-time feedback on class. So I will email it out to everyone now. And if anyone has any questions or wants to turn anything in, please come down and see me.